Hi, I'm Susan Wingrove Reed, the education consultant for the Anchorage Symphony Orchestra and the principal keyboard player. And I can tell you, everyone in the symphony is really excited about reopening night that is about to come for finally bringing us all together. Whether you are live streaming or attending in person, we welcome you back to be with our orchestra family. And the music we're going to be sharing with you is just beyond exciting and beautiful. So what a return it will be under the baton of our music advisor, Elizabeth Schultz, who is masterfully leading us through our initial rehearsals after an 18 month break from being all together. So here's to being safe and here's to some great music about to happen live. So I'd like to talk a little bit since we can't do our regular pre-concert chats at the back of the hall, at least during all this COVID time. I'm going to share some ideas about the music and the composers and hope that maybe it will give you a few insights and things you didn't know about what you might be hearing on Saturday night at our concert. First off, after the traditional um, anthems, the national anthem and Alaska's flag are always done every year at our first concert and we missed that so much together last year. So this year we begin anew with that tradition and then we will be saluting our maestro Randall Craig Fleischer by performing a movement of his Echoes um, work that we have played so often under his baton and Elizabeth is leading us through um, it was emotional reading it the first night of rehearsal, the first music that we played together without Randy, and we miss him terribly, but we are so grateful to have Elizabeth with us and to lead us through this beautiful music and as a tribute to Randy, who we will never forget his impact on our orchestra and community. Elizabeth has chosen four different works to present on the program after the um, opening pieces. The first is a short three minute overture called Celebration by the Dean of Afri African American Composers whose name is Adolphus Palestor. He was the son of a chef born in Albany, New York and he sang in a fabulous public school high school choir and the renowned Episcopal Church Choir in his community. He's now one of America's most respected African-American composers and professors. He's written in all genres of music, commissions by major, major orchestras like the Chicago Symphony and the LA Phil. He's probably most famous for his choral music, but he's written a lot of instrumental music, chamber music, art songs, he does it all. Critics have frequently described his music of the last 30 years as a crossover hybrid of African-American and European-American music. He's a Howard University undergrad. He then studied in France with the legendary Nadia Boulanger. He was the only Black student there and the only Black student at the Manhattan School of Music for his master's degree and the Michigan State program for his doctorate. He also served in the Army. His music is engaging with clear and heartfelt themes. He's currently finishing a Requiem Cantata for George Floyd. The title is A Knee on the Neck. And he said of it, it got some of the fury out of me to focus it into a piece. He was insulated, he said, from the developing civil rights movement in early education as when he was growing up. I was sheltered from the storm and stress of American culture. But he said it all kind of came to a reckoning when he got out of the army in 1968. The development of his music from then on was fascinating. Rich musical influences from the mid 20th century symphonies and a push forward, but also including Episcopalian music, spiritual stories from black history. For example, he wrote a work called Epitaph for Martin Luther King Jr. Capriccio for a dearly departed brother, Scott Joplin. Still Holding On, a commission in 2019 for the LA Bill, honoring William Grant Still. You get the gist. In an interview, he kind of laughed as the interviewer on NPR said, well, you're getting more progress pro prolific as you age. And he said, yes, as someone said, part of it is just showing up. I'm still alive, so I might as well keep writing. Regarding being the only black student in grad school, he said racial identity pressures were not as strong as they have become in universities today. 
I just loved the composers I loved, and I never thought about the fact whether they were black or white. Barber Bernstein Copeland. But then I began to realize there are two different constituencies and cultures, always there, but I hadn't been aware of the deep South African American culture. So I've done more integration of African American elements with my European training. I'm always evolving. That might bother people who want a composer to always sound the same, but that ain't me, he said. Regarding diversity, a big topic as arts emerge from COVID and are faced with new challenges of not only being curators of beautiful art, but also paying attention to historically neglected voices, such as those of women and people of color. He said, there's an entire repertoire that exists already and doesn't require any use of especially African-American or female composers. Conductors don't have to know about it. They didn't learn about it in schools. And I do hope that will change. It's a long time coming. We need artistic administrations and conductors and performers to be interested, to do the research, to dig in. And there's lots on the internet. You have to care to make this happen. Celebration was written with a bicentennial focus for America. He wrote it in 1974 on a commission from the National Symphony. Bicentennial, Bicentennial was coming up in 76. As I mentioned, it was three minutes and it's full of colors and rhythms and lots of brass. Simply wonderful. Our wonderful, use that word again, concertmaster, Catherine Hofer is going to be featured on our reopening night playing in about an eight minute Beethoven romance. The first in G major it was published in 1803. There's um, lots of stories about how brash and egotistic Beethoven was when he left Bonn as a young artist to move to Vienna in 1792. He had a reputation as a pianist pretty instantly, but he knew he was going to make his mark in history as a composer. One of his friends perfectly described him as an unlicked bear. There are two romances, this is number one, and he was starting to work on his to be legendary violin concerto. These two pieces are kind of like a slow movement in a concerto, especially comparable to Mozart's very popular piano concerto number 20 that included a slow movement romance. Beethoven loved that work, by the way. He was also influenced by French and German classical style works of romances that were song-like instrumental works. The form of this romance that Catherine will be featured in is Rondo, A-B-A-C-A. -A -A. And I found a really charming definition of a Rondo in a clever little book called One Does Not Spell Mozart with a T. And this was this author's definition. Rondo form is easily explained by an analogy to a person lost in the woods. He keeps wandering and wandering, but every so often returns back to his starting point. The rondo is just like that. The composer begins with a good first theme, but soon begins to wander from it. For want of anything better, he returns to it, wanders some more, returns to the theme and so forth until he gets tired and stops to wait rescue. The form is easy to write since the composer must think of only one good theme and getting lost is second nature to most composers. This romance has a gorgeous melody with double stops that are tricky and beautiful that opens and then the violin partners with the orchestra to a highly ornamented and virtuosic ending. Beethoven studied the violin as a kid and he played in orchestras in Bonn and he also studied the violin when he arrived in Vienna. He loved and knew the instrument well and it shows. Comfortably fitting the instrument wasn't easy then, and it still isn't in so many ways. Um, an annotator I found, Michael Clive, commented that while sometimes Beethoven wrote against the instrument, pushing the conventions of technique, his two romances were written to fit the traditions that violin soloists love. I was lucky to have a read through a few days ago with Catherine as of her pianist playing through the orchestration. She plays this so elegantly, and you are in for a musical gem. Just lovely. Also on the program is a Danzon, Danzon number two by Marquez. 
born in 1950, still a living composer, and he wrote this piece around 1994. He was born in Mexico, the oldest of nine children. The family moved to LA when he was 11, and he started composing at 16. Studied in Paris, Mexico, and the California Institute of the Arts. He loved traditional music. His father played a lot of traditional music. And when he moved back to Mexico after all of his education, he explored dance halls back at home after writing what had been kind of abstract style. He wrote eight danzons. Number two is so popular that it is nicknamed the Mexican Second National Anthem. If you're a fan of Mozart on the, in the Jungle, which was on Amazon Prime, I think, as a series, um, season two, episode six, there's a youth orchestra that plays this piece directed by a character based on the Los Angeles Philharmonic's Gustavo Dudamel, the amazing conductor. Dudamel's tour with the Venezuelan Simon Bolivar Orchestra around Europe and America in 2007 won tons of fans to this piece. It's full of amazing colors, icy melodies, features soloists throughout the orchestra, and is hugely fun to play and to hear. In an NPR interview, it was stated that this is music with echoes in an old dance hall on the streets of Mexico today still. Marquez said that my adolescence was spent listening to sounds of mariachi bands, the Beatles, the Doors, Carlos Santana, and Chopin. So there you have his influences. And Danzon number two is an homage to a very strict ballroom form and is sometimes compared to Ravel's evocative La Valse which we played with Randy several years ago. This and the vaults are symphonic treatments of traditional volume dance. Aaron Copeland also wrote a danzon in 1930. Here, there are a huge range of enticing infectious moods from lonesome nostalgia at the opening and sultry episodes, rhythmic exuberance, and an over the top exhilarating ending. And finally on our program, the awesome, amazing Symphony Number no. 8 by Dvorak. His dad was an innkeeper and a butcher in a small village. He played the violin, as did the new young boy, and then they would all play kind of family together for dances and small groups. But dad was focused on a trade for his son, and at the age of 14, sent Antonin to live with an uncle to learn to speak German fluently, because to be a good innkeeper, you needed to know that language. But Antonin found a wonderful music teacher while he was living with his uncle, and he studied violin, organ, and viol viola. He lobbied hard, the uncle did to have the boy be able to go to Prague for music study, but dad refused because they were going through some hard times and actually then brought him home. A year later, he went back to live with the uncle. And this time, the music was obviously such a strong pull that the uncle said he would help him, the boy, move to Prague. So at 16, there he went. And he was enrolled in a, a reputable school and um, did a lot of playing gigs in the city. But then the money stopped from his uncle, so he had a crucial decision to make. Do I go home or do I try to make it as an artist? So he stayed, gave cafe concerts, played gigs again, barely able to buy food. He spent 11 years in an opera orchestra where he said, I kept studying hard and composing a lot, but not eating very much. He married and then finally got some attention when Brahms was on a panel awarding some honorariums to promising composers. Brahms became an advocate for Dvorak, provided him a publisher and up Dvorak's sword. He was an eccentric and interesting, very intelligent man, um, especially loved trains, boats. He raged pigeons, walked and walked and walked in the woods as his favorite form of meditation and exercise. While he was alive, I wanted to point out that there's some confusion about the numbering of the symphonies. It was thought when he died that he had written five symphonies and the one you will hear was number four. New World Symphony was number five. Well, what happened was after his death, 
four earlier symphonies were discovered and published. So all the numbering switched. So now instead of number four, this is number eight. And the New World Symphony also had a promotion at number. The melodies in the symphony are just full of heart. And the writing went really quickly. He wrote it in the country where he loved to be the most. The first movement has a somber intro, but then I love Leo John Janacek, a fellow Czech composer's description of the melodies as new ones just keep coming with friendly nods to each other. And then the second movement, a slow movement, alternates seriousness with joy and contradictions with a thrilling climax. The third movement is a radiant waltz, wistful at times, with main tunes that are were rescued or borrowed from his opera, The Stubborn Lover. The fourth movement begins with a big trumpet fanfare and then a theme of, and variations, and the cellos get to present the theme. The variations range from a lovely flute solo to a minor key march, and then everything appears to fade peacefully, but then there is a big satisfying ending. And we all love those. It had its premiere in early 1890. And in 1893, Dvorak conducted this symphony at the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago for Bohemian Day. The Chicago Symphony was enlarged to 114 players for this performance, all of them men at the time. His biography, Hans Holbert Schinshofer said, this is his most intimate symphony. The work breathes his beloved walking in the woods and forests around his country home on a warm, sunny day. Birds singing, leaves rustling in gentle breeze. You can hear the music. So, and then the, the last movement just completely blossoms out. So on that note, I hope that some of these thoughts will trigger some wonderful images as you experience the music of your Anchorage Symphony as we symphony on, on our reopening night. Thank you for joining us and supporting our orchestra, so important in our community. Thank you for your support. <laughs>